On This is America and the World, our focus is women in the military and women veterans. Recently, the U.S. House Subcommittee on Health and Human Services held a hearing to examine the concerns of organizations representing women veterans. Later on this program, you'll meet Jen Silva, Chief Program Officer of the Wounded Warrior Project, who testified before the subcommittee. Nearly 5,000 women gave their voices to this initiative. Our guest now is retired U.S. Army Specialist Jomarty Cruz, who shares her personal and traumatic experience in the military. Jomarty Cruz, is that correct pronunciation? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. What attracted you to join the military? Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I was married once upon a time, and it was a joint decision that we had made. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for him, um, and I had already sworn in, so off I went. Uh, you served in uh, Afghanistan, huh? I did, correct. Uh, it was not a happy uh, uh, welcome that you uh, faced. Can you tell us a little bit about your welcoming in Afghanistan? I was part of an aviation unit that's male dominated. And upon arrival to Afghanistan, not only were we in an active war zone, but I dealt with sexual assault and sexual harassment from my own unit. And so it was a very um, trying time. Uh, yes, there was good and bad moments, but uh, definitely, you know, a, a lot of challenges that I faced throughout that year. Mm -hmm. I've read that even with me asking a question about your experience in a war zone can trigger uh, a, a kind of a repeat in your mind and in your emotions of what you experience. But rather delicately, can I ask you to kind of paint a picture for us of what it's like to live in a war zone? Yeah, absolutely. So. You know, upon arrival, it, it takes a couple of days to get to your final forward operating base. The night that we landed on our uh, FOB, as we call it, um, we were under attack immediately Ooh. after unloading from the aircraft. And we immediately took cover. We did what we had to do. And that was that moment where it really hits you and you realize, wow, this is going to be my life for the next potential year, right? Mm -hmm. So an aviation unit deploys every other year and it kind of just six, sinks in. You hear the stories, you you know, you, you've seen certain things, but it, there's nothing like living it, hearing, you know, the sounds of gunshots, um, just alarms going off. Uh, you, you don't know what's going on. You don't know if you're going to survive. And that really became my life for the next year. So uh, sleep wasn't really some. I was definitely sleep deprived. It wasn't something that you can really shut off and go to sleep. You're just constantly on high alert, um, just really trying to survive and make it through. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, are you part of a, a, a larger unit of, of how many people would be uh, at that forward base? It was a it was a pretty large. I mean, headcount. It's kind of rough to say. I would say. Um, my unit was easily over 130. Mm -hmm. um, and there were several units, plus there was a special forces unit. Um, and we also have local contractors, civilian contractors. Um, and then we have foreign nationals that work on base. One of the things that I keep learning and, and, and doing these uh, programs has been an education for me is, uh, first of all, when you're in that kind of a situation, there's a, there's a tremendous bonding with fellow uh, uh, soldiers, right, men and women. Um, did you lose friends when you were there? We did, we did. We, we lost some, some members of our team, um, which was obviously very unfortunate. Um, but yes, it's, it's very trying. Mm. It's very difficult. So there's living in the war zone, all of that, uh, shelling, bombardment, sirens, uh, gunfire, uh, losing people. Then on top of all of that, uh, there was this uh, sexual assault as well. Is that, uh, I won't uh, uh, go there, but um, uh, 
Is that usual? Usual is a hard word. Women experience that a lot, don't they, in the military? So honestly, to tell you the truth, it's it's both genders. So males and females are uh, targets. Um, in my particular case, my unit was male dominated and there was only a handful of females. And I just so happened to uh, be one of the straight single ones. And so being in that type of situation where horm hormones are going uh, at a rapid pace, uh, you become a, an easy target. Um, and I had just joined the unit. No one really knew who I was. I was getting to learn who my team members were. Um, I was getting to learn my job at the same time, um, on top of that, trying to survive. So it's just, it's one of those things where it, it's it's definitely, you see it. You, mm -hmm. you see it day in and day out. It, it almost becomes uh, normal for Whoa. sexual harassment to occur. Whoa. What caused you, did you put in the, the full, full year there or what, how, what caused you to separate, huh? So actually during my time uh, overseas, there were several different sexual assault and sexual harassment play, uh, cases that took place. One of them actually, um, we went through the full UCMJ trial and he served time. Was that with you? Yes. So. Um, a, a two second recap, he was actually one of my assigned battle buddies. Um, and he was assigned to me due to the ongoing rapes that were occurring on the forward operating base. So for our safety, our first sergeant assigned us battle buddies. And he was a staff sergeant that was assigned to me for my protection. Uh, little did I know that he had been uh, filming me taking a shower for a series of five months that surfaced through an investigation that occurred when files were found on a USB that he had shared. And uh, one of the files had my name on it. So when the investigative team, the CID team came into play, uh, there's videos that surfaced. Um, obviously, you can tell I was oblivious to the situation. The way that it occurred was, again, due to the fact that there, it was male dominated, the shower trailer that we had they sectioned off one shower with plywood, but the plywood didn't go all the way up. We had our, our own personal entry door towards the back of the trailer, but the plywood didn't go all the way up. So he mounted a GoPro mm -hmm. and that's what he utilized to film and sell to other soldiers within the unit or share with other soldiers within the unit. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very, you know, obviously I felt betrayed. Uh, the unit's expectation was for me to brush it off and you know stick together nothing really happened in their eyes that that was uh, critical and so coming back into garrison back into the states um through particular traumas that had occurred and certain challenges um in an injury i was medically retired mm. uh you've had uh uh, I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, and thank you for your uh, openness and your vulnerability in sharing that with us. Uh, I'm just so sorry. Um, you've had a tough go. You had a tough go uh, in separation. Uh, what were some of the symptoms and some of the things you had to deal with? So... Uh... The, the main challenges was not real. You don't really have a voice in the military, right? So there was three particular females that protected me during my time in the military. One of them was my female commander. Um, she really took front and center, helping me, protecting me. I was dealing with retaliation upon returning to the States. People were following me. There was death threats because of this trial. Wow. Um, and it was ongoing. And so, you know, she became, she became that, that protection, you know, and if it wasn't for them really in that support system, um, I don't, I don't know if I, if I would have made it, you know, and then coming out of the military, you're really trying to truly understand what is it that you're going through? People tell you, you have PTSD, but what is PTSD, right? Because they give you the diagnosis, but they don't really tell you how to cope with the trigger points in your emotions, right? And they don't teach your family how to deal with, with you because it's a new version of yourself. So 
um, you you're you have anger management issues. You know, you're uh, everything bothers you. You want to be isolated. Um, and it, it took about three years coming out of the military. Uh, once I, I was introduced to the Window Warrior Project where I actually felt like other people understood me and I and I felt comfortable and I started opening up again. How deeply involved uh, are you in uh, uh, Wounded Warrior Project? And uh, I know that one of the things that you took part in, one of the programs that they offer is this Odyssey uh, program. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and how how that's uh, helped change your life, huh? Yes, absolutely. So um, once I joined the Wounded Warrior Project, um, I was introduced to them by one of my neighbors. A, a list, they send you out an email, and in the email there's different events, whether it's peer support groups, odysseys, events, just uh, sometimes it's just a dinner where you can sit down and just chit chat with other like-minded individuals, right? And Project Odyssey became an opportunity. And so you go through a series of questions and upon arrival to the location that they sent us, it was a phenomenal experience. I mean, for the first time, I'm interacting with individuals where I don't feel alone. There's other people that have gone through the same thing. There's other people that understand what it is to be on a deployment. There's other people who understand the challenges that you deal with, right? There's certain words, there's certain terms, mm. there's certain things that you deal with that people don't understand. And Project Odyssey, I mean, they staffed it with, they had a therapist, you know, just in case you, you, you needed a moment where you needed to ground yourself. There was someone there listening. They had um, team building exercises, you know, they, they really sat down, took the time to understand what you were going through and say, hey, I'm here for you, I'm listening. And upon completion of Odyssey, if there was anything else that we needed, uh, they were offering services as well and follow-up calls to make sure that we are that we were all okay. And that to me was a very pivotal moment where I felt, wow, someone really cares, you know, and the VA is not listening, uh, the military is not listening, and here comes a nonprofit organization that's all ears willing to be an extreme support system for me and my family. Mm. Uh, isn't it amazing uh, that uh, we don't know each other, you know, uh, and uh, this uh, opportunity comes for us to just talk with each other. Uh, you just, uh, just, uh, you've just educated us so beautifully today uh, of the, uh, I guess, the good, the bad, and the so-so of, of military, and, and you've had a rough go. Uh, it, it's just thrilling to talk with you, and and. And you're so open and honest and vulnerable. I think you're going to help an awful lot of people just listening to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you so and much for this opportunity. Good luck to you in the new job, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition, streaming live April 9th, 2021. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Sultanate of Oman. the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Thank you, Ms. Silva, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, you have just been testifying before a House uh, Subcommittee on Health, I guess, today. Tell us a little bit about the, the hearing, uh, how exciting that was for you, and uh, kind of give us a broad scope of the who, what, when, where, and why of the hearing, the House hearing today. Great, yes, I'd love to. Uh, so we had the, I had the privilege of, of testifying in front of the subcommittee and um, was grateful to be able to illuminate some of the information that we found after we invested the last year into our Women Warriors Initiative and really highlight some of the 
uh, challenges that women veterans face in including access to care, good quality care within the VA or within the community care network of the Veterans Administration. Also some of the long-term effects that women have related to military sexual trauma, which affects about 44% of the women that we serve at Wounded Warrior Project. And then finally, some of the things that can be learned through what we've been able to do operationally related to peer support groups and virtual environment, how that can really be uh, a powerful tool in serving uh, women veterans. So we were able to highlight that to the committee, the subcommittee, and um, we were grateful uh, to also hear from the VA that they want to work with us to to really be a partner in increasing access to care for the largest growing cohort of service members in the largest growing cohort of uh, veterans. So, uh, you know, we all need to be ready to really serve uh, women in both while they serve and then also afterwards after they um, become civilians. So we were excited to be part of it. So, so l l let's lay this out for the folks at home that uh, the uh, Wounded Warrior Project uh, put together uh, a, a kind of a, a mega survey of, uh, of women of which I gather 5,000 women participated just about in the survey uh, over, as you said, over the last year. And then there were a number, uh, a dozen or more round tables of people who had participated in the survey. And uh, just in a, in a, in a simple, uh, that's a lot to chew <laughs> off right there, but what was the goal that you were looking for going in? But while we've, at Window Warrior Project, we've served women since our inception in 2003 uh, within our women warrior population. But we really wanted to dive in over the last year because we were seeing challenges uh, from serving women. We, we knew that they were uh, telling us that they had unique and discrete challenges that were not being addressed. And so we wanted to take the year to really listen. We're a very data-driven organization before we go out and advocate for something, we wanted to get some data around it. And so that's why we invested the time over the last year to really dive into the largest issues that are related to transition and access to good quality care. And, and so that's what we did over the last year. Okay, so, so, so you did the study and you boiled it down. And so uh, give me three areas of concern of women who uh, I guess either either are serving or have transitioned out, if that's the correct phraseology, uh, wh what, are the, what are the three major concerns that they have? Uh, there, there may be five, but let's focus on top three, huh? Three is a good number, great, yes. So, um, so I would say the number one, uh, well, the number one issue I would like to talk about is access to quality care. We have found that uh, so um, the women about veterans we're talking about health care now, right? Okay. Yes, we are talking about health care within the VA system. So the women veterans that we serve have served honorably and they um, have earned their care within the VA system. Yet, as you can imagine, the VA system has been uh, developed to serve mostly male patients uh, okay. because that's the majority of, of veterans. Um, and, and so when it comes to care that is gender specific, it has become an issue in getting that good quality care, both in VA facilities or in the community care network, so outside the VA facility. And what we believe is that uh, the VA should be the coordinator of care, but we really need to be creative about and really focus on getting good quality care. First of all, the physical environment has shown to not be uh, safe and, in, and particularly welcoming for women veterans. And um, as I mentioned also earlier, a compassionate, really comprehensive care related to military sexual trauma is something that needs to be addressed within the VA. And so that is something that we found, uh, frankly, is a bigger problem than we thought. And when 44% of the women, of the 5,000 women that answered say that they were sexually assaulted in, in, while serving, that's a big number. And so we, we want to make sure that the VA facilities or the, the community care that they receive is really safe and welcoming. Um, and and that's, those are two main focuses that we saw from, from the Warrior um, Initiative. And then also, finally, transition. They, 
we are finding that isolation is a big problem for women veterans. So as you can imagine, there's still 10% of the veteran population and veterans today, when they transition from active duty or their service in the National Guard um, or reserves, they kind of scatter. They don't go into a community that necessarily knows them. And then if you're 10% of that population, really it can add up. 89% of the women that we surveyed said that they feel isolated. Mm. And so we want to make sure with that context in mind, uh, we want to make sure that we set up good peer support groups, whether they're virtually uh, done virtually or in person, make sure that um, their transition in their transition, that they are connected with other women veterans so they can feel like they're not so isolated. And those are three main um, themes that we saw from our year of diving into this research that we w really want to tackle and be a partner with. So. Uh, care, the quality of care, the environment for the care transition, these are all uh, concerns of yours. Um, so I gather the, the veterans folks, VA, made a presentation, and then you were one of several organizations as well who put forth some testimony. What other organizations were testifying uh, as well today? other veterans organizations? Yes, yes. So we were there with uh, Disabled American Veterans, DAV was there, and um, Minority Women Veterans, and then a, a couple other groups, or one other group, and, um, and so we were grateful to be part of the mix, and, um, and really, and, and like I mentioned, the VA, uh, several leaders from the VA were on the panel as well. And, and they answered questions from Congress. Uh, so just to put a couple of other things on the table, uh, our time is limited, but you mentioned uh, isolation. Uh, I gather that uh, a lot of the women talked about financial uh, stresses, uh, that they were unprepared for trans uh, transition, transitioning out uh, jobs, and uh, this idea of uh, being part of a community, which I gather also kind of reflects their service. They were part of a community coming out and not having a community and this sense of isolation that you talked about. What points do you think that the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, uh, got? What, what registered, do you think you made some progress today in the service of women? Well, I think um, they're fully invested in making the environment and the transition uh, better for women veterans. Okay. That's the feel I got from their uh, time today. Uh, but they have a big job ahead of them. Um, but one thing that I think is really important um, that we feel is very important is the interconnected and clear communication between two government agencies the DOD and VA is particularly related to women's health Excellent. and and uh, military sexual trauma. And so the more that they can coordinate and have clear communication, the more coordinated the care can be for women veterans and who have a level, might have a level of distrust or mistrust with uh, both of those entities if there's harassment going on. And so we're, we're excited to, that um, they really saw that as a clear uh, a clear area that they want to be part of. You mentioned the, the financial stress, and I think that's another theme that is worth talking. If I can, if I can um, give a plug to that for a minute, because what we found that the women veterans that we serve, they have higher levels of education than their male counterparts, and but yet they mm -hmm. have a higher unemployment rate, and they have a, a different a pay gap, about eight thousand dollars pay gap um, per, on an annual basis in their salary. And so we're trying to figure out how we can be part of, of fixing that. And, and so it, it just doesn't make sense that with the level of education that they have, that there would be um, the higher unemployment rate and, and that disparity in pay. And so we're, we're working with the women warriors that we serve and really great companies who want to be part of that um, solution to really make, because these women veterans bring so many great skills to the workforce, they're leaders, uh, they're really great um, teammates, uh, it, it just like male vet veterans, and so we're excited that um, we can be part of that uh, with the uh, women veterans that we serve. Thank you, uh, Ms. Silver. Thank you very much, uh, Chief uh, Program Officer 
for the Wounded Warrior Project. And uh, between uh, yourself and uh, uh, Ms. Cruz that we also talked with uh, a little while ago and put into this program, uh, I think you've given everyone a wonderful education. So thank you very much. Uh, you've had a long day, uh, I'm sure. Some stress involved, uh, but uh, thank you very much for the education. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you are in crisis or know someone who is, these resources offer immediate help. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition, streaming live April 9, 2021. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy.